Hollywood, California, Monday, June 28th. <laughs> the Lux Radio Theater presents Walter Winchell and Josephine Hutchinson in the front page with James Gleason. Lux presents Hollywood. We appreciate your enthusiasm for Lux Flakes. It is your regular purchase of Lux which enables us to bring you this program, sponsored by Cecil B. DeMille, with Lewis Silvers conducting. Tonight's stars are Walter Winchell, Josephine Hutchinson, and James Gleason. We had hoped at this time to bring you Miss Amelia Earhart. However, she has not yet completed her sensational round-the-world flight, so will be heard instead next Monday evening from the Lux Radio Theater, if she will have arrived by that time. Our guests tonight are Miss Kathleen Howard, fashion editor of Photoplay magazine, and John McSue, fabric expert and motion picture technical advisor. From our stage on Hollywood Boulevard, we welcome you to another hour in the Lux Radio Theater. Before we start our play, I'd like you to hear a letter we received from Miss Miriam Kint, who lives in Eastern Pennsylvania. Here's what she says. I can never thank you enough for your fine products and your equally fine entertainment. I'd miss both of them very much if I ever had to do without them. I never get tired of them. I'm a radio fan, a movie fan, and a Lux fan. I couldn't keep house without it. Well, Mrs. Kent and others will agree that one thing which makes housekeeping much easier is washing dishes in Lux. Lux flakes dissolve instantly into rich, creamy suds which mean easier dishwashing and softer, prettier hands. And no wonder, for Lux is free from harmful alkali that roughens and cracks your skin. Lux, for all your dishwashing, costs only a trifle a day. And now, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. His mother named him Walter Winchell. But they call him the man who owns Broadway, the Burbank of the printed page. He made a halo of an orchid and turned a scallion from a vegetable to a stinging rebuke. He's the most original, most highly paid, most copied, and most widely known among reporters. When at a loss for words, Walter simply makes up new ones. To him, people don't get married, they middle aisle. They don't talk on the radio, they radio rate. They're not glamorous picture personalities, but cinema actors. He's found that news walks at night. So he chases it in a car with a radio and a police siren. He's left-handed and does not carry a gun. Born in New York in 1897, he knew that a good education was essential to success. So instead of quitting school at the fourth grade, he patiently plodded through till the sixth. At 14, he was singing in a newsboy's sextet produced by Gus Edwards. His teacher was our musical conductor, Lou Silvers who had to rescore the music every day because Walter's voice changed every two minutes like a woman's mind. Walter got his first smell of printer's ink by publishing a small theatrical sheet called News Sense. It was the spark that set off the journalistic skyrocket, which has carried him along to his present birth on the New York Mirror and 136 newspapers from New York to London, Paris, and Honolulu. Starred currently in Wake Up and Live... Walter reverts to type tonight in playing the part of Hildy Johnson in the front page. In the role of Peggy Grant is Josephine Hutchinson, called upon at the last moment to play the part due to the illness of Joan Bennett. Miss Hutchinson brings to our theater the same spirit and talent that flavored her acting on Broadway. From Eva Legallion's celebrated civic repertoire, Miss Hutchinson came to Hollywood as a member of Warner Brothers, as a Warner Brothers star. Just a few days ago... She signed a long-term contract with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. James Gleason, after a notable career as actor, writer, and producer, also came to Hollywood from Broadway. Now at RKO Studios, he makes his third appearance on our stage in the role of Walter Burns, managing editor. Our deadline has arrived, and we send tonight's edition to press as the curtain rises on the Lux Radio Theater presentation of the front page, starring Walter Winchell and Josephine Hutchinson with James Gleason. newspaper office in the city of Chicago. 
At his desk in the inner sanctum, Walter Burns, the managing editor, talks to one of his staff on the telephone. He's just received a disquieting bit of news, and he pounds the desk violently, sending a shower of papers onto the floor. Don't give me that. He can't quit. When did he walk out? Why didn't you stop him? Well, you're a help. Well, stop him now. I don't care if he's getting married to the Empress of China. Hildy Johnson works for this sheet and is going to keep on working for it. Listen, Duffy, there's a hanging schedule for tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. They're hanging Earl Williams at the Cook County Jail. Hildy Johnson has got to cover that hanging for us. And if he doesn't, by heaven, I'll hang you. Now get to work. Find out where he is. Stop the wedding ceremony. Do anything you want. But get Hildy Johnson or I'll kick you from here to Michigan Boulevard and back again. Yes, and and I said a point to ask for me. Tell her to go dunk his head in the lake. I'm finished. Through, and then I walked out. Oh, Hilda, you really quit. I promise I would, didn't I? Yes, darling, but it's almost too good to be true. Hildy Johnson, ex-newspaper man. That's me, honey. From now on, I'm going to eat my dinners at home. Then afterwards, I'm going to curl up on the radiator with a good book. I'm going to let the other guys hustle for the news. I'll be reading it, and it better be good. Boy, what a life. Oh, Hildy. We will be happy, won't we? We can't miss, honey. We'll be married in New York, darling, just as soon as we get there. Can't be too soon for me. Jeez, I almost forgot. Hey, driver. Yeah? Stop at the criminal courts building, Cook County Jail. Okay. Hildy, what for? I gotta say goodbye to the boys, honey. What boys? The so-called gentlemen of the press. They'll all be up there covering the hanging and wishing they were home in bed. Huh? <laughs> I gotta give them the horse laugh. But Hildy was supposed to be at Cousin Emma's at seven shops. And the train leaves at 11.15. It's all right, baby. Don't you worry about me. You run along to Emma's. I'll be up right away. Hilly, you'll never get away from them. When you get talking with those friends of yours, you... Emma will be furious if you don't get there, and so mother. Listen, Peggy, I know what this means to you. You don't think I'd let you down at a time like this, do you? I'll be up at Cousin Emma's before she drags out the cake. And what's more, I'll eat it, too. But I gotta see the boys, Peggy. You understand, don't you? I may never see them again. I hope. Well, all right, but... Not a girl. Give us a kiss. <laughs> Hildy. Come on, driver. Get going in there. Okay, I'll take a chance. Uh, it deal me out. I'm oh, I was ahead a minute ago. Well, all right. Hello? Press room? Two, one, Hildy Johnson? Two, no, he ain't here. Three, three, I two, said he ain't here. Two, okay. Hey, who was that, Wilson? Right, Burns do? again, trying to reach Hildy Johnson. Hello, give me Sheridan oh, 2000. Hey, right, Murphy, well, what is the idea? Yeah. Is that the only telephone got? in the place? The only one with a mouthpiece on it. <laughs> How many times have I got to tell you fellows to leave my <laughs> phone right, alone? On, no if you've got right. to talk through a mouthpiece, go buy one like I did. Ah, shut up. Give me Sheridan 2000. I won't shut up. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this phone clean of germs. Hey, Bensinger, what is this? A hospital or something? Oh, look now, at come this on, run it. Who put that pie in there? I did, but don't eat it, Bensinger. It's rotten. I don't intend to eat it, but I don't intend to let you fellas use my desk as a garbage can. Check it's too big a desk anyhow. It takes up too much room. Okay. LaSalle. Three, four hundred. Hey, Bensinger, did you see the sheriff? Oh, why don't you get your own news? All right, all right. You oh, hello, Jake. This is Benzinger. Yes, here's a new lead on the Earl Williams hanging. Yes, I just saw the sheriff, yes. He won't move the hanging up a minute. Oh, I don't care who he promised. All right, yeah. all right, I'll talk to him again, but it's no use. Uh, the execution is set for seven it... o'clock in the morning. Oh, and get this, the condemned man ate a hearty dinner. Yes, uh-huh. Mock turtle soup, chicken pot pie, hash brown <laughs> potatoes, combination <laughs> salad, and pie a la mode. Make mine the same. No, no, I don't know what kind of pie. Hello, what? this now is listen. Wilson. Give me a rewrite, man. I said I don't know what kind of Ready, pie. Ready, I don't know. Get this. Very hot stuff. Yes. A doomed man ate a hearty dinner. As follows. Noodles, soup, roasted beef, chicken potatoes, cranberry sauce. And pie a la mud. Yeah. Peach or pie? Peach pie. That's <laughs> a scoop pie. Yes, yes. Peach pie. Uh, oh, shut up, will you? Oh, all right, Jake, yes. Yes. Oh, yes, and one thing more. Dr. Max J. Egelhofer. Yes. Max J. Egelhofer from Vienna. Well, he's going to examine Williams to see if he's sane. No, I don't know when. In an hour or so, I'll let you know. Hold it, Charlie. I've just seen the sheriff again. They're going to look for screws in William's dome. Yeah, psychologist. Dr. Egelhofer. Wait a minute. Hey, Benzinger, how do you spell that doctor's name? Oh, go and find out. All right, sourpuss. I don't know, Charlie. Spell it any way you want. Hello, you lazy train. Hello, Hildy. How are you? Hildy, we heard you quit. Sure, I 
right quick. Hey, will you look at this guy? Look, yum, he's wearing yum. a cape. Kiss me, Hilly. Let go, now let go. He's even got a shave and a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Hildy, it's Walter Burns on the phone. Tell that phony he knows where he can go. <laughs> will you do me a favor and talk to him? He's called you nine million yeah, times. What's the matter, scared Hilly. of him, Hildy? Yeah, are you? I'll talk to that maniac with pleasure. Give me the phone. Hello, Mr. Burns. What's that, Mr. Burns? Why, your language is shocking, Mr. Burns. <laughs> now listen, you big baboon. Get a pencil and paper and take this down. And get it straight, because this is important. It's the Hildy Johnson curse. Yeah, the Hildy Johnson curse. The next time I see you, I'm going to walk right up to you and hammer on that monkey skull of yours until it rings like a Chinese gun. Oh, Ooh, boy. Is that that telling no, I ain't going to cover any hanging. I wouldn't cover it for you if they held it in the middle of Clark Street. Never mind the oil, Jocko. It won't do you any good this time, because I'm going to New York, and I'm going to get married. And if you know what's good for you, you'll stay west of Gary, Indiana. A Johnson never forgets. And that voice is what they call telling the managing you editor. Oh, Goodbye forever. Hey, Goodbye. Oh, forever. shut up. What'd you quit for, Hildy? Yeah, we hear you're going to get married. I'm getting married, all right. See these? Three tickets to New York. What do you mean, three? Me and my girl and a old lady. Kind of sudden, baby. What do you want to get married for? Maybe he's in love. love. He's in love. <laughs> hey, when's the wedding, Hildy? It's in New York, so you guys ain't going to have any fun with it. None of them fake warrants are kidnapping the bride with me. Everybody's getting that to New York, Buck. It's a rube town for mine. I was on a New York paper once. Say, you might as well work in a bay. Which one of them journals are you going to work for? None of them. Who wants to work on a newspaper? What are you going in for, the movies? I am not. Publishing offers. 150 smackers a week. Yeah? Here's the contract. I was just waiting to get it down to black and white before I took a potter on Burns. And his Burns sore. That rotten <laughs> snake brain. The ungrateful ape. Call me a traitor. A traitor. After 10 years of sweating my pants off for practically nothing. Traitor to what? What did he or anybody else in the newspaper business ever do for me? Except try to make a bum out of me. Says you can't quit without notice. What does he think I am? A hired girl? Why, one more waiting I'd have gone over there and busted him right on his Durante. <laughs> hey, why didn't you tell a fellow you were going to quit? And have Burns hear about it? I've always wanted to quit. Just like that. I've been planning this for two months. Packed up everything yesterday. So did my girl. Furniture and everything. You're going to miss a swell hang on, Hildy. Yeah, you can have it. I'm a businessman now. I got a dumb brother went in for business. He's got seven kids and a mortgage. And belongs to a country club. And never gets, gets worse every year. Just a fathead. Listen to who's talking. Journalists. Peeking through keyholes, running after fire engines like a lot of coach dogs, waking people up in the middle of the night to ask them what they think of Mussolini. A lot of Daffy Budinskis borrowing nickels from office boys. And for what? So a million nitwits and their wives will know what's going on. What's that? They're stretching the rope for Arnold Williams. Yeah, making it nice and soft. I don't believe that guy ever did shoot that cop. He don't look like he's got enough brains to pull a trigger. Whether he did or not, he's hanging high in the morning. Well, I gotta beat it. So long, you hey, mugger. No, 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 Close no, that door, Kruger. You can't do that, Hilly. Now, wait a minute. It's your last night, Hilly. We gotta celebrate. Nothing to listen, listen, I gotta go don't with be my a heel. Yes, don't be a heel. I'm not a heel. You are so a heel. Sure, walking out on us, and us the losers. What are you talking about? I'm talking about all the dough you lifted around here playing poker. That's right. You gotta give us a chance to get it back, Hilly. You kidding? You won it, didn't you? Sure, but what's the idea? Then sit down. Don't let him out, Kruger. Well, all right, you dirty tramps. I'll play only for a half an hour. Only a half an hour, and I hope I trim the pants off you. Hey, Hildy. Yeah, Hildy. Yeah, Hildy. Yeah, Hildy. Yeah, Hildy. Come on, out seven bucks Hey, now. where are those sandwiches? Hey, you come ordered? on, Hildy, come on. Stop looking at your watch. Listen, you? fellas, I gotta go. No, no fooling. Oh, hey, no, sandwiches. No, no, come on. Oh, well, hello, Sheriff. Who's All right. yelling that up was, here? That was me, Sheriff. Sit down and take a hand. You can have my place, Oh, no, you don't, know, Hildy. Sit down. Now, listen, boys, listen. You gotta be quiet. There's a man over there in the death house. How do you suppose he feels... Listening to all this revelry. A lot you care how he feels. Keep your shirt on, Pinky. Wait a minute, you. I don't want to hear any more of that Pinky stuff. I got a name, see? Peter B. Hartman. What's the matter with Pinky? He's, He's all right. Who's right. all right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> stop, stop now, honest boys. <laughs> What's the idea of hanging a name like that on me? Pinky Hartman. How's that going to look to the voters? Now, never mind the voters. What about moving the execution up to 5 o'clock so we can all make the city addition? Yeah, that's a small idea. How about it, Pinky? Come on, be a good guy. Now, 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 that's kind of raw. You can't hang a fellow in his sleep. 
just to please a newspaper. No, but you can reprieve him twice, so the hanging will come three days before election, so you can run the law and order ticket. You can do that all right, though, uh, can't I, you? I've huh? had nothing yeah. whatsoever to do with these reprieves. That was entirely up to the governor. Oh, yeah? Well, how do we know there won't be another reprieve tonight? There won't be. No? What about that doctor? Suppose he finds Williams insane or something. Yeah. He won't find he's insane because he isn't. Even if he was, you'd hang him to get the vote. Boys, 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 boys. Now, 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 uh, uh, yeah. easy now. I know you. Now, uh, uh, he's going to look him over in my office in a couple of minutes, and then you'll know all about it. Besides, there's nothing he can find out. Williams is just as sane as I am. Sane a pinky. <laughs> oh, 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 there's no oh, use of talking to you, boy. Yeah, I wondered how long it'd take you to find that out, pinky. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Oh, yes, ma'am. Hey, Hildy, it's your girl. Oh, Holy shit. Give me that. His girl. Ain't, Hello, it pinky. Ain't it romantic? What's the matter, honey? I know, but I, I couldn't help it. Here's your sandwich, hey, boy. Oh, so am I, baby. Hammonies. What's the matter? Haven't we got the well, muffins? Oh, sweetheart, there's nothing yeah. to cry about. Yeah, come on. Lay off those potatoes. Oh, honey, it's the boys. Yeah. They're all yelling, of course, darling. <laughs> of course I'll be there. I'm leaving now. That's mine. Oh, Peggy, if you talk like that, I'm going to ride out and jump in the lake. I swear I will. I can't stand it. Listen. We're listening. Go ahead. <laughs> Darling, I love you. <laughs> love you. I said I love you. Oh, wait a minute, fellas. Give him a break, will you? That's the stuff. That's better. I'll be right there, honey. Now, don't take it easy. I'll, right away. I'll be right over. <laughs> honey, Bye. baby, you'll be right over. Did you hear that? <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Hey, Hildy, it's Burns again. Tell him to give us a rest, will you? Yeah, oh, on, Hello. Listen, Burns, you're making a nuisance of yourself. What's the idea of calling up all the time? No, I'm through with newspapers. I don't give a hoot what you think of me. I'm leaving for New York tonight, right now, this minute. Well, goodbye, you rotten wage slaves. When you're crawling up fire escapes and getting kicked out of front doors and eating a Christmas dinner in a one-arm joint, don't forget your old pal, Hildy Johnson. Well, goodbye, Hi. 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 Well, we see you again, Hildy. The next time you see me, I'll be riding in a 16-cylinder wagon, giving out interviews on success. Goodbye, Hildy. Well, Goodbye, take care Hildy. of yourself, Johnson. So long, Holy! What is this? A jailbreak! Get over to the window! Hey, what's the matter? What's happened? What's the case? He's probably trying to get Who got away? Who was it? Earl Williams! He got away! Give me that telephone, quick! This is going to make a bomb out of here! Give me Waller, boy. Quick! Hello, Waller. This is Hilly Johnson. Forget that. Forget it, I tell you. Listen, Earl Williams just slammed out of the county jail. Yeah, yeah, just this minute. Don't worry. I said don't worry. I'm on the job! <laughs> We continue with the front page presently. But for the moment, I'd like to take you into the famous Laurel Canyon in Hollywood. There on a vine-covered porch, sitting in a swing hammock, are a boy and a girl, very much in love and trying hard to be practical. Just now, Dick is doing the talking. Oh, I wish we could get married soon, Ann. But I don't know how I'm going to buy you dresses like that new one you got on. Why, oh, yeah, I bet that cost a week's salary. Darling, this dress isn't new. And it costs practically nothing. Well, it certainly looks expensive. That's because I know how to get things at bargain prices. Yeah. And say, it is swell looking. And I know how to keep them nice, too. I only buy dresses that are luxable. What do you mean, luxable? You can keep them nice in Lux, darling. Lux flakes. Oh. It hardly costs anything to take care of things that way, and they look like new so much longer. Yes, Anne, you're one of the millions of girls who know that Lux brings down the cost of looking smart and well-dressed. This year especially, stores everywhere are showing so many smart, inexpensive clothes that are luxable. Cotton, silks, and linens, all kinds of summer fabrics will stay new-looking much longer if you care for them with Lux. These gentle flakes are safe for anything that's safe in water alone. Lux cuts down expensive upkeep and makes your things look like new all season long. Once again, Mr. DeMille. We continue with the front page, starring Walter Winchell and Josephine Hutchinson with James Gleason. With a condemned man roaming free somewhere in the city, things are happening fast around the criminal court's building. The press room is deserted for the moment, when suddenly Hildy Johnson bounds through the door and grabs a telephone. Hello, hello. 
Give me Walter Burns. Hello, listen. Keep this wire open every second, you understand? Hello, Burns. Fine. Now, listen. I got the whole story from Jacoby, the assistant warden, and I got it exclusive. That's right, and it's a pip. Only listen. It cost me 260 bucks, see? Just a minute, I'll give you the story. I'm telling you first I had to give him all the money I had, and it wasn't exactly mine. 260 bucks, and I want it back. Well, what did you hear? Did you hear what I said about the money? All right, then here's your story. It's a jailbreak of your dreams. Dr. Max J. Egelhofer, a profound thinker from Vienna, was giving Williams a final sanity test in the sheriff's office. You know, sticking a lot of pins in him to get his reflexes. Then he decided to reenact the crime. So as to study Williams' powers of coordination. Well, I'm coming to it. Will you shut up? Of course he had to have a gun to reenact it. And who do you suppose supplied it? Peter B. Hartman. B for brains. I tell you, I'm not kidding. Hartman gave his gun to the professor. The professor gave it to Earl, and Earl shot the professor right in the stomach. Ain't it perfect? Egelhofer? No, not bad. They spirited him away to Passavant Hospital. No, we got it exclusive. Now listen. Listen, Burns. It cost me 260 bucks for the story, and I want it back. I had to give it to Jacoby. I had to give it to him before he spill it. $260, the money I'm going to get married on. Never mind about my fine work. I want my money. No, I tell you, I'm not going to cover anything else. I'm going away. Listen, you big stiff. I just did this as a personal favor. Now I'm leaving town and I haven't got a dime. When will you send it over? Well, see that you do or I can't get married. I'll be waiting right here in the press room. Hildy. Oh, hello, Peggy. What was that over the telephone? Nothing. I was just telling Walter Burns. I was all through. That's all. How are you, you darling? You haven't done something foolish with that money. No, oh, money. no. You still have it. Of course, gee, darling. You don't think for a minute. I think I'd better take care of it from now on. Now, listen, honey. I can look after a couple of hundred bucks, all right? Now, Hildy, if you still got that money, I want you to give it to me. Now, sweetheart, it's going to be perfectly all right. Well, you haven't got it. No, not this minute, you but You did do something with it. No, he's sending it right over. Burns, I mean. It'll be here any minute. Hildy. Listen, darling. I wouldn't have had this happen for the world. But it's going to be all right. Now, here's what happened. I was just standing out to the house to get you when this guy Williams breaks out of jail. You know, the fellow they were going to hang in the morning. Yes, I know. Oh, sweetheart. I had to do what I did. I had to give him the money so he wouldn't give the story to anybody else. Jacoby, I mean. That's the assistant warden. I got the story exclusive. The biggest scoop in years. Do you know how long Mother and I waited out there at the house? Oh, Peggy, listen. You ain't going to be mad at me for this. I couldn't help it. You'd have done the same thing yourself. I mean, the biggest story in the world busting and nobody on the job. I might have known it would happen again. Oh, listen. Every time I ever wanted you for something, on my birthday and New Year's Eve, when I waited till five in the morning. But a big story broke. Don't you remember? It's always a big story. The biggest story in the world. And the next day, everybody's forgotten it, even you. What do you mean, forgotten? That was the Clara Hammond murder on your birthday. Oh, Peggy, it won't hurt to wait five more minutes. The boy's on his way with the money now. You know that Mother's sitting downstairs waiting in a taxi cab? If she knew about that money... It's all we've got in the world, Hildy. We haven't even got a place to sleep in except the train. Oh, and... gee, I wouldn't do anything in the world to hurt you, Peg. You make me feel like a criminal. It's all that Walter Burns. Oh, I'll be so glad when you get away from him. You simply can't resist him. Peggy, I've told you what I think of him. I wouldn't raise a finger if he was dying. Then why did you loan him the money? I didn't. You see, you won't listen to me or you'd know I didn't. Now, look, I had to give the money to Jacoby, the assistant warden. Here they are, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, hello, Mrs. Grant. I was just explaining to Peggy. Mother, I thought you were going to wait in the cab. Well, I just came up to tell you the meter's gone to $2. Yeah, sure, but that's going to be all right. I had a terrible time finding you. First, I went into a room where a lot of policemen were playing cards. Yeah, I'll tell you what we'll do. Then I met that policeman and asked him where Mr. Johnson's office was, and he brought me here. Now, listen, Mother, I think you'd better go downstairs, and we'll come just as soon as we can. Hmm, you've got a big room, haven't you? Where do you sit, Hildy? Now, I'll tell you what you do. You and Peggy go on over to the station and get the baggage check. Here's the tickets. Now, Hildy. I'll be along in 15 minutes, maybe sooner. How do you mean? That you aren't going? Of course I am. Now, I'll meet you at the information booth. Come on, Mother. Hildy has to wait a few minutes. It's, it's something about the office. He's getting some money. Money? Yeah, they're sending it over. It's my salary. They're sending over my salary. Your salary? At this hour? They were awful busy, and I couldn't disturb them very well. Well, the trouble is you're too easy with people, letting them wait till this hour before paying you your salary. How do you know they're going to give it to you at all? Mother, now we'll go on over. He'll, he'll be along. Do you know what I'm beginning to think? What? I think you must be a sort of irresponsible type or you wouldn't do things this way. It just occurred to me you didn't do one blessed thing about our getting away. Now, you stop picking on Hildy, Mother. Well, I had to sublet the apartment, pack all the wedding presents. That's a man's work. You weren't even there to put the things in the taxi. And I had to give the man 50 cents, too. And now here you stand with the train leaving any minute. Huh? Now, Mother, I never missed the train in my life. Come on, Mother. That's the girl. Now go ahead. Go ahead. You'd better be there, Hildy. Don't worry about me. I'll be there. 
Goodbye. Sheriff's office. Out from speaking. What? Yes, yes, where? Well, surround him. Put a hundred men around the house. And if he gets away, I'll break every cop on the force. Well, Sheriff? They've spotted Earl Williams. He's in a boarding house over in Clark Street. That's a break. Those newspapers hound the tails off of us if he ever got away. Listen, Jacoby, he ain't going to get away. This thing means votes. And I'm going to hang Earl Williams if it's the last thing I do. Oh, Sheriff. Who are you? My name's Pincus. I got a paper here for you. It's from the governor. What's from the governor? Why, why, the reprieve for Earl Williams. For who? Earl Williams, the reprieve. Wait a minute. Is this a joke or something? Huh? It's a mistake. There must be a mistake. Look at this, Jacoby. Insane, he says. He knows darn well that Earl Williams ain't insane. This reprieve is pure politics. It's an attempt to ruin us. What can you do? I only brought it over. You, you can't blame no, it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, listen, Mr. Pincus. You didn't bring this over. You couldn't find me. I never saw the reprieve. Huh? But you got it in your hand, right? Well, for 150 Now you'll shut up and listen. How much money do you make now? 20 bucks a week. And car fare. For 150 a month, you could forget this reprieve business, couldn't you? You could say you couldn't find me, couldn't you? But I did find you. Oh, ye gods. Look, look. Here. Take this reprieve away. Go away. Don't come back until tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock and keep your mouth shut. I'll settle everything with you tomorrow. Well... All right. Uh, that's the boy. That's the boy. Now, uh, go on. Go it on. sounds awful funny to me, though. You're taking a big chance, Sheriff. Oh, chance. Don't I know it? Don't you think I realize... Hey, Sheriff! What do you want, Johnson? Did Walter Boyd send anybody here with some dope for me? No, he didn't. All right, Pinky. Don't get sore. I hear you surrounded Williams. Yes, we have. Nice work, Pinky. I bet you'll let him go so he could vote on Tuesday. Ah, uh, get out of here. If anyone comes for me, I'll be in the press room. Hello, Duffy. Hello. Hello, Duff. This is Hildy. Listen, where's Burns? Where did he go? Well, listen, Duffy, I'm waiting here for the boy to bring over my money. The $260 he owes me. Yeah, in the press room. He told me the boy was on his way. What are you laughing about? Listen, Duffy, has that maniac started that money over or not? No, I ain't got time to come over to any office. I missed the train. Oh, shut up, Duffy. Listen. Listen, will you? Wait a minute. Who's at that window? Who's out there? I'll call you back, Duffy. Who's out there? What's the idea of crawling around on fire escapes? Excuse me. Excuse me. I, I had to come in. I had to. Well, who are you? Me? I, I, I'm Earl Williams. Earl Williams. Hold oh, with searchlights. Put down that gun. It ain't loaded. I fired all the bullets already. Well, give it to me. Here. I surrender. I couldn't hang off that roof any longer. Yeah, get away from that window. I'm not afraid to die. I was telling that fellow that when he handed me the gun. Shut up a second. Let me lock Waking the door. Waking me up in the middle of the night, talking to me about things I don't understand, calling me a murderer. I ain't a murderer. But sometimes I just can't think straight. I, I get a pain up here. Be quiet. Let me think. Go on. Take me back and hang me. I done my best. Will you shut up? Sit down over there. Go ahead now. Go on. Sit down. Hello. Give me Burns, quick. I didn't mean anything. I just didn't think. Hello, Burns. Jeez, Burns, listen. You got to get over here. I said you got to get over here. I got Earl Williams. He's here with me now. Earl Williams. Yeah. Yeah. Who is it? Open up, open up. It's me, Burns. Well, where is he? I thought you'd never get here. Come in, Louie. Close that door. Okay, boss. I brought Louie along to give us a hand. Well, where is he? Where's Williams? He's in the desk. What desk? The big one, right here. I stuck him in there and pulled down a roller. Open it up and let's get a look at him. Hello, Williams. Let me out of here. I can't stand it. Please let me out. Keep quiet, your mug. You're sitting pretty. Close that desk. Who's out there? Hildy, what's holding you up? Oh. Who's the dame? It's my girl's mother. Yes, and I've waited just as long as I'm going to wait. Shut up. Shut up. What? Please, please. Who's oh. that? There's somebody in that desk. Don't be silly, lady. What would a man be doing in a desk? I don't know, but there's something going on here. Shut up. I won't shut up. Who's in that desk? Now, mother, please. Take her out of here, will you, Louie? What did you say? Now, look here, please. Louie, get some guys to help you and take this lady over to Polak Mike's and lock her up. 
See that she don't talk to anyone on the way. Okay, boss. I take good What's care that? of her. Come on, now, Burns. You can't do Come that. On, lady, don't don't you no touch me. Business. Tell him it's a I'm case of delirium treatment. Let me go. Listen, Burns, this will get me Come in an awful lady. jam. I really go. Shut up, lady. Or hey, I'm wait, wait. Don't. Take it easy. Here Let me go, will you? What for? Let go of me. I got my girl downstairs. She's downstairs in the cab all along. Your girl. What are you? Some half-baked college boy? Why, in time of war, you could be shot for what you're doing. For less than you're doing. Never mind that. There's your story. Locked up in that desk. Smear it all over your front page and take all the credit. I covered your story and I covered it right. Now I'm getting out. You drooling saphead. What do you mean a story? You've got the whole city by the seat of the pants. I know all about that. You don't know beans. You've got the brains of a pancake. Listen, Hilly, if I didn't have your interest at heart, would I be wasting time now arguing with you? You've done something big. You've stepped into a new class. Honest? Listen, we'll make such monkeys out of Hartman and his ward healers, nobody will vote for them, not even their wives. Expose them, huh? Expose them? Crucify them. We're going to keep Williams undercover till morning so we can break the story exclusive. Then we let the opposition party in on the capture. Share the glory with them. I see. You kicked over the whole city hall like an apple cart. They've got Hartman backed against the wall. You put one administration out and another one in. This ain't a newspaper story, it's a career. And you stand there belly aching about some girl. I wasn't figuring it that way, I guess. We'd be the white-haired boys, won't we? Why, they'll be naming streets after you. Johnson Street. <laughs> you and I are going to run this town, do you understand that? Yeah, yeah, but wait a minute. We can't leave Williams here. One of those reporters will be back. We're going to take him over to my private office right away. Where's our phone? That one, the red one. How are you going to do it? They'll see him. Now that he's inside the desk, we'll, we'll carry the desk over. Hello, give me Duffy. You can't do that. It's crawling with cops outside. We'll lower out the window with pulleys. Quit stalling. Get that machine start pounding on the lead, will you? Come on, snap into it. How much you want of it? All the words you got. Hello, hello. Can I call the sheriff uh, an animal at bay? Call him anything you want. He can't read anyhow. <laughs> hello, Duffy. Get set. We got the biggest story in the world. Earl Williams, caught by our own reporter, Hilly Johnson. I want you to tear out the whole front page. That's what I said, the whole front page. Out. Johnson's writing the lead. Hildy. What do you want? Get out of here. Ma. Hildy. Listen, miss, listen, you can't come in here. Listen. Where's mother? Hello. Hello, Peggy. I've got to ask you to do something. A what big favor. You're not coming. Now, listen, take all those missing Don't get sore. Don't get sore and fly off the handle. What happened was this. Let me tell you. You're not, are you? Now, Tell me, Hildy. Me... Tell me the truth. Now, look here, little girl. You're doing this to him. He was going and you stopped him. Something terrific has happened, Peggy. Wait till I tell you. I just couldn't. You'll tell her nothing. She's a woman. Well, I'm not going to let you do it. You're coming right now with me. Holy it's the biggest shit. chance of my life. Now, listen, honey. Oh, shut up, will you? You don't want to marry me, that's all. That ain't true. Just because you won't listen, you're saying I don't love you when you know I'd cut off my hands for you. I'd do anything in the world for you, anything. You never oh, intended to be decent and live like a what? human being. Peggy, you were lying all the time. That. Don't what say that. Don't say that. Lying, that's what you were, just lying. All right, if that's what you think. I see what you are now. You're just a bum. Like him over there and all the rest. Sure, that's what I am. You're just a heartless, selfish animal without any feelings. And you're worse, Mr. Burns. It's all your fault. And if you think I'm going to put up Shut with up. you... Shut up. Whatever. Duffy, I'm bush. Shut up, will you? Yeah, that's what I am, a bum. Without any feelings. And that's all I want to be. Get a hold of Butch as fast as you can. You never did love me, or you couldn't talk to me like that. If you want me, you'll have to take me as I am. You can't turn me into any lottie dow with a cane. I'm no stuffed shirt. I'm a newspaper man. <laughs> all right, then. Stay a newspaper man. Tie yourself to that rotten old typewriter. Do anything you want. But I'm finished with you. Do you hear? I never want to see you again. Tell me, have you got that lead? Have I? Take a look at this. It's terrific. <laughs> we pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. the front page for a moment and turn to the motion picture section. There, under the caption of Hollywood personalities, we encounter John McSood, one of the world's foremost linen experts. Picture studios, in their endless effort to perfect every detail of a film, use Mr. McSood as technical advisor in scenes showing table linens, handkerchiefs, and linen costumes. In close-ups particularly, they must be absolutely correct. Mr. McSood has devoted a lifetime to that which we ordinary mortals dismiss with a sneeze, the handkerchief. When not at the studios, he spends his time operating one of our more exclusive shops. It's known as the Kerchief Bar at the crossroads of the world, 
where many of our stars are frequent visitors. Handkerchiefs, ladies and gentlemen, have been a collector's item for centuries. Among the screen's more avid fanciers of handkerchiefs are Jane Withers, Jeanette McDonald, Leslie Howard, Tyrone Power, who prefers them in silk, Gracie Allen, and Joan Blondell. George Raff may be tough on the screen, but he goes in for handkerchiefs with his name embroidered in petty points. Oh, which isn't so strange when we consider that even Napoleon took time off between battles to collect about 3,000 handkerchiefs made of lace. Napoleon probably started the handkerchief vote of, of the early 19th century. Every well-dressed lady carried a fine lace handkerchief, but it was never employed for practical purposes. She used her petticoat instead. Today, of course, we use handkerchiefs both for blowing and showing. In my shop, I have 12,000 different patterns in handkerchiefs for which people pay as high as $750 a piece. Mm, to pay that much for a handkerchief, a fellow must keep his nose to the grindstone. Then take a less expensive one, the kind, for instance, that sells for $100. That's 12 inches of the finest hand-spun lustrous linen. It comes from Ireland, France, or Belgium. From there, it goes on a long journey through the Suez Canal to China for expert handwork. It's hem-stitched in southern China and is sent to my headquarters in Shanghai. From there, it goes to northern China for embroidery and back again to Shanghai for the finishing process. Before this takes place, a year and three months of hand labor have gone into that handkerchief. Back in Shanghai at my headquarters, it gets seven baths. Three are in a secret solution which removes all stains. Three more are in rainwater, and the final bath is in Lux flakes. Why Lux in particular? Well, there are very good reasons. In the first place, fine linen should be washed only in the most gentle of soaps, free of alkali, and that require no rubbing which might spread the weed. The second reason is that Lux flakes restores to linen its original creamy whiteness and luster. Only after its bath in Lux is the handkerchief brought to the United States. By this time, it has traveled about 17,000 miles. Many of the least costly handkerchiefs, those that come few for a dollar, travel just as far. And while a handkerchief is considered a necessity in civilized society, I believe that the savage bushmen of Australia were the first to use them. Their handkerchiefs were large leaves. That's correct, Mr. DeMille. Then came the Romans, who wore plain linen handkerchiefs around their necks as a symbol of social distinction. Today, in Ireland, many girls, when they go to bed, put a linen handkerchief under the pillow, believing it would work wonders in getting them husbands. And also, at the present time in China, if you embroider a handkerchief with a certain type of stitch, you'll go to prison. They call it the forbidden stitch. So intricate that many people who attempted it went blind. It has been banned for a hundred years. So you see, there's drama even behind the simple word Gesundheit, just as there is in this great play you're presenting tonight, which I don't intend to hold up any longer. Many thanks. Mm -hmm. You win by an hour, Mr. McCurdy. Back again to Walter Winchell, Josephine Hutchinson, and James Gleason in the front page. Police have discovered their mistake, but the man they surrounded was not Earl Williams. The search has been renewed again around the city, the county jail. In the press room, Walter Burns and Hildy worked furiously against time to spirit away their prisoner concealed in the roll top desk. Burns is on the phone again. Hello. Hello, Duffy. Where have you been? Stick in this phone. Listen, did you impress it on Butch to take a taxi? That every minute counts? Who's he bringing with him? What do you mean you don't know? But you told Butch it was life and death, huh? All right, stick in the wire. Butch is on his way. Hell, he's going to help us move the desk. All we got to do is hold out for 15 minutes. The boys will be back. They'll be coming in here to phone. Hey, Williams, you all right in there? Knock on the desk. Listen, Williams, I'm going to knock three times. That's our signal, see? Get it? Answer with three knocks if you're okay. That's the boy. Three knocks is me. Don't forget. Got enough air? Good boy. Oh, come on, Hilly. Get going in there. Tear into it. Don't sit there like a frozen robin. You've just bollocked up my whole life. Do you know that? What? She was the most wonderful girl I'll ever know. She had spirit, brains, looks, everything. Who in blazes are you talking about? My girl. Who do you think? What are you going to do? Start mumbling about your girl now? You've got a story to write. I practically threw her out. Like she was a dame. You're acting like a man for the first time in your life. Now, don't start crawling now. I'll never love anybody else again. They don't come like that twice in a guy's life. You'll sleep it off. Now, listen, Hildy. I got enough on my mind. When she was sick in the hospital and you sent me on that wild goose chase all over K Kentucky for three weeks, she never even complained. Oh, sick in the hospital? She was. She nearly died. I see. She didn't complain, but she just nearly died. That's all. 
I would have been on the train now. I would have been almost to Gary. Ah, uh, listen, Hilly. You've had a good rest. Now get back on the story. Who is it? The criminal boss, Louis. Louis, what's he doing back here? Hello, boss. Oh, what's the matter with you? Where'd you get that black eye? Where's the old lady? What'd you do with her? What happened? You been in a fight? Oh, down to Winterworth Avenue. We were going to 65 miles an hour. You know what I mean, the boss. Take the marsh out of your mouth. Where's the old lady? I'm telling you, we were on a smack into police patrol. You know what I mean. We broke him in half. Was she hurt? Where is she? Tell me. I'm telling you, can you imagine bumping into a load of cops? They come rolling out like oranges. What did you do with her? What became of her? I'm asking you. Oh, search me. When I come to, I was running down 35th Street. Get me? Oh, you screwball. I give you an old lady to take someone, you hand her over to the cops. What do you mean I hand her? The patrol wagon, she was on the wrong side of the street. She's probably squawking her head off at some police station. Now everything is fine. Well, I don't think she's talking very much. You know what I mean. You, you mean you, you mean she was killed? Well, I ain't sure, but there's a good chance. Oh, my God, dead. That finishes me. Listen, Hilly. That's fate. What will be, will be. What am I going to say to Peggy? What will I tell her? You're never going to see her again. Snap out of it. Would you rather have the old dame dragging a whole police force in here? I killed her. I did it. How can I ever face her? Listen, Hilly, if it was my own mother, I'd carry on. You know I would. Shut up, you murdering no good. No matter how I felt, if my heart was breaking, I'd carry on. For the paper. Where was it, Louis? I'll go out. You stay here. Let me alone. Right when I'm surrounded with my back against the wall, you ain't gonna lie down on me. I'm gonna lay down on you and step in your face, you murderer. Scared, huh? Yellow running out of your collar. I don't care what you think. I'm gonna find my girl's mother. Who's that? What's going on in there? Sheriff. The sheriff and the rest of the boys. Now we're in a oh, sweet spot. Spot or no spot, I'm leaving. Don't open that door. Hey, 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 Take your paws off me. Hold him, boys. Hey, Sheriff, what do you think you're doing breaking in here like this? You can't bluff me, Burns. I don't care who you are or what your paper you're editor of. Let me go. Let me go, fellas. Something happened to my girl's mother. Hang on to him. What's the idea? I'll tell you what the idea is. One of the prisoners was looking out of the jail window about an hour ago. And he saw a man come down the fire escape and into this window. That man was Earl Williams. What are you doing, Hildy? Hiding him for a scoop? Yeah. I don't know anything about it. Let me out of here. He knows plenty. Come on, Piggy. Give him the third degree. Where is he, Johnson? Where you got him? You're barking up the wrong tree, Hartman. I'll give you three minutes to tell me where he is. Come on, Johnson. Where is he? All right. He went over to the hospital to call on Professor Egelhofer. What? Yeah, with a bag of marshmallows. In here, madam. This is the place. Mother. And that's the man. His name is Burns. Mother, I'm so glad to see. Are you all right? Tell me. You let me alone, Hildy Johnson. What's the idea here? This lady claims she was kidnapped. What? They dragged me all the way downstairs. I tried to get help, and they began to pinch me. I'm black and blue, all over. Then they ran into another automobile, and I was nearly killed. Just a minute. What did Walter Burns have to do with this lady? He was the one in charge of everything. He told them to kidnap me. Madam, are you referring to me? You know you did. You told that man to take me out of here. What about this, Burns? Well, Kidnapping, eh? It's beyond me, Sheriff. Who is this woman? Oh, oh, what a thing to say. No, madam, be honest. You're out joyriding, drunk, and you got in some scrape. Why don't you admit it instead of accusing innocent people? You ruffian, you unprincipled man. How dare you say a thing like that? Please, Mother, don't mind him. He's just crazy. I'll tell you something else, officer. I'll tell you why they were hiding. They were hiding a man in here. Hiding him? Yes. In here? Madam, you're a two-faced liar. Uh, holy... What was that? What someone that? in that deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. someone knocked back. Someone knocked back. back. Sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, yeah, stand, stand back, you man. Come out here, Williams. Come out, do you hear? We've got you covered. Open that desk, Jacoby. All right, you got me. Now go ahead, shoot me. Grab him, grab him. Take him down to the jail. Swear out a warrant for the arrest of Walter Burns and Hildy Johnson. You can't do this to me. I can't, eh? Listen, sir, if I gotta get married tonight. Aiding and abetting an escaped criminal. Johnson, you'll be lucky if you can get married in the next 20 years. <laughs> Sheriff speaking. Oh, yes, Prasalski. Come over to the press room as soon as you can. Jacoby and I are holding a couple of important birds. I want you to take their confessions. You'll have to regret this, Pinky Hartman. If he lives at all. <laughs> Hear that, Jacoby? Yeah. Whistling in the dark, Chief. Yeah, through, Burns. Yeah? 
The last man that told me that was Barney Schmidt. A week before he jumped out of the window. Is that so? Yeah. And when that doctor sued us, remember? False arrest. Oh, yeah. Dr. J.B. Godolphin. Dr. Godolphin sued us for $100,000. It seems we called him a quack. Well, the day of the trial came and the doctor was on his way to court. With all his lawyers and medical witnesses. Drowned, by heaven. Drowned in the river. With their automobile, their affidavits, and their law books. And I've got the same feeling right now I had that five minutes before the accident. Your luck ain't with you now, Burns. Ha- Hello, Sheriff. It's Pincus. Here's your reprieve. Get out of here. You can't bribe me. Get out of here, you. I won't. Here's your reprieve. What's that? Who is this man? Throw him out. Come here, you. Who was bribing you? And they wouldn't take it. Oh, you're insane. What did I tell you? An unseen power. What's your name? Irving Pincus. It's a frame-up. That's what it is. A frame-up. He's an imposter. Murder, huh, Sheriff? Hanging an innocent man to win an election. That's a lie. I never saw him before in my life. When did you deliver this repay, Pincus? Who did you talk to? Tonight, they started right and bribing me. Who's they? Uh, the sheriff and Jacoby. But that's absurd on the face of it, Mr. Burns. Oh, he's talking like a child. Just a minute. All right, Mr. Pincus. Let's have your story. Well, I've been married for 19 years. Skip and, all uh... that. Skip that. Wait, wait. Jacoby... Take those handcuffs off the boys. That wasn't at all necessary. Well, I was just going to. Well, I can't tell you how badly I feel about this, Burns. There was no excuse for Jacoby flying off the handle and putting you under arrest. Well, I was only doing my duty. There wasn't anything personal intended. Listen, you guys had better quit politics and take in washing. Uh, Jacoby, this document is authentic. Earl Williams, thank heaven, has been reprieved. And the Commonwealth of Chicago has been spared the painful necessity of shedding blood. Go on, you chiseling heel. You'd hang your own mother to win an election. Hildy! Peggy, oh, Peggy, darling. Hildy, what's the matter? What are they going to do? Mother said... Peggy, don't bore me out now. Nobody's going to do anything to anybody. Why, of course not. My good friend Walter Burns and I understand each other perfectly. I trust. Sure, sure. Everything's okay, Sheriff. Thank you, Mr. Burns, <laughs> Thank you. Come on, Jacoby. Come on, Pincus. We've got to deliver that reprieve. Wait till those two birds read the paper tomorrow. Eldie, tell him what I want you to do. What? I want you to get this guy Pincus over to the office tomorrow. Nothing doing, Waller. I'm all washed up. I mean it this time. Hildy, if I only thought you did. Listen, Peggy, I'm telling you the absolute truth. I'm going to New York with you tonight, if you give me this last chance. I'll cut out drinking and swearing and everything connected with the newspaper business. I won't even read a newspaper. Listen, honey, I've got a great idea. There's nothing you can say can make me change my mind. This time I'm through and I mean it. I know I don't deserve you, Peg. I've done everything in the world to prove that, I guess. Oh, Hildy, please, now don't say things like that. I've got a rotten nerve to ask you to marry me. I'm a prize package, all right. But if you'll take me, here I am. Darling, don't talk that way. I just want you the way you are. Peggy. Oh, Hildy, I didn't notice anything like this. Why don't you say something? I'd be the last person in the world to want to come between you and your happiness. Why? You ought to know that. I love you, you crazy Swede. You're getting a great guy, Peggy. Never mind the Valentines. Goodbye, you big bohunk. You're a great newspaper man, Hildy. I'm sorry to see you go. Well, if I ever come back to the business, which I won't, there's only one man I'd work for, and you know that, don't you? I'd kill you if you ever worked for anybody else. Hear that, Peggy? That's my diploma. Well, Burns, I don't know what to say. Except that I'm going to miss you like blazes. Same here, Hildy. Hildy, if I thought you were going to be unhappy, I mean, if you really wanted to, no. No, it's your chance to have a home and be a human being, and I'm going to make you take it. Well, I wouldn't let him stay. Go on, Hildy, before I make you city editor. Hurry up, Peggy. He means it. What time's your train go? Well, there's another one about 12.40. New York Central, eh? I wish there was a time to get you a little wedding present. It's awful short notice. Here, take my watch, Hildy. Oh, no, boy. Shut up. You're going to take it, I tell you. This watch was a present of the big chief himself. And if you look inside, you'll find a little inscription. To the best newspaper man I know. When you get to New York, you can have my name scratched out and your own put in. I wouldn't do that, and you know I wouldn't. This is too good for me. I can't take it. You've got to. Go on, Hildy. Take the watch if Mr. Burns wants you to. You don't want to hurt his feelings. Well, this is the first and last thing I ever got from a newspaper. Goodbye, Mr. Burns. I always had a queer opinion of you, Mr. Burns. I still think you're a little peculiar, but you're all right underneath. I mean, I think you're a peach. So are you, Peggy. 
She looked just like a little flower. Come on, Peggy. Goodbye, you big baboon. Goodbye. Goodbye, Johnson. Be good to yourself and the little girl. The same to you and many of them. Hello, Duffy. Walter Burns, listen. I want to send a wire to the chief police of LaPorte, Indiana. That's right. Tell him to meet the 1240 out of Chicago, New York Central. And arrest Hilly Johnson and bring him back here. Why? I'll tell you why. The squint-eyed weasel stole my watch. <laughs> So we complete the last page of the front page and devote the next few moments to a meeting with Kathleen Howard, editor and actress. Starting her career as an opera singer, Miss Howard was a favorite throughout Europe for several seasons prior to her debut at the Metropolitan Opera Company, where she sang for 12 years. Turning author, she contributed to many national magazines, became fashion editor of Harper's Bazaar and president of the fashion group. A desire to act brought her to Hollywood, where she played opposite W.C. Fields in three pictures. Much of her time, however, is spent as fashion editor of Photoplay magazine. And in this capacity, she comes to us now. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kathleen Howard. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Hollywood fashions are growing more and more important. Almost every week, some prominent visitor from the East comes out to investigate them. Most of them are kind enough to come and chat with me. They are all struck with one thing, the thousands of costumes that make up the wardrobe departments of our leading studios. Many of these costumes, I tell them, are not new. Some of them may be two or three years old, but they look like new because, as most of the world knows, Hollywood takes care of its wardrobe with Lux Flakes. Lux means light, according to the Latin, and the wardrobes of our famous studios are certainly alight with cleanliness. An odd fact is that when I go to the homes of the stars to ask them to pose for me in their private wardrobes for my color page, they frequently tell me that they haven't any clothes. At first, I thought this was just a polite way of saying, oh, don't bother me just now, Miss Howard, but I found out that it's often literally true, and it's so understandable. You see, when you're on a picture, you fuss and fuss all day about your hair and your makeup and your clothes, and when you have a few precious days of leisure, you revel in tossing all that overboard, in becoming an ordinary individual in the adored privacy of your own home. What's your answer, Miss Howard, to the ancient question... Do women dress for men or for other women? I think women dress for men and against women. That is, they dress to please men and to disarm the criticism of other women. However, the primary purpose in showing fashions in photoplay is to give the fans a chance to copy the styles of their favorites. In doing this, it is advisable for girls to find out first what type of screen star they resemble. Long ago, I divided girl types of beauty into two basic categories, the kitten and the fox. The kitten type, roughly speaking, if one may speak roughly of these charming girls, is represented by Janet Gaynor and uh, Claudette Colbert, the short face with a small, piquant nose. The fox type is the longer face with a straight nose, like Joan Crawford or Merle Oberon. The fox type looks best in sophisticated, tailored clothes, while the kitten may do very well indeed by going fluffy and feminine if she wants to, and all will be forgiven. Uh, what have you to say about fashions for fall? Oh, just a note of warning. Fashion shows a huge range of choice for the coming fall, with many amusing, whimsical notes dressed. Hats are crazier than ever. Delightful, but crazy. So, unless you have an unlimited budget, the best plan is to go safe, sane, and simple at first, and add the highlights later. If you hear that the low waistline is coming back, don't shudder and think that we're going back to the badly proportioned silhouette of 1926. This time it will be much cleverer, and there's nothing to be afraid of. And now... Till we meet again in photoplay, all my thanks. Thank you, Miss Howard. We now present a Lux Radio Theater Extra, headlining our headliners, Walter Winchell and Josephine Hutchinson. In reading the criticisms of your last picture, Wake Up and Live, the critics all agree on one point, Walter, that your performance was the first genuine portrayal on the screen of what reporters are really like. What do you mean, my last picture? <laughs> that wasn't an eye job, Mr. DeMille. That was a wee job. 
The big credit should go to screenwriters Curtis Kenyon, Harry Tugand, and Jack Yellen. You know, most of us think that the prototype of all police reporters is Hildy Johnson. That's not quite true, Joe. Not many of his kind are left anymore. I mean the old swashbucklers. Most of them are now working on their second million, having given up all thought of ever acquiring the first. <laughs> it's interesting, I think, to look back on the names of those who were in the front page when it played on Broadway. Nine of them have since come out to Hollywood. Lee Tracy, Osgood Perkins, Alan Jenkins, Willard Robertson, Joseph Kalea, Dorothy Stickney, George Barbier, Eduardo Cianelli, and Francis Fuller. Mm, a barrel of genius there. But what can you tell us, Walter, of your two friends who wrote the play, Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur? Hecht and MacArthur are both ex-Chicago police reporters, Mr. DeMille. They started the front page to belittle the newspaper craft. They found they couldn't do it. To quote them, the front page is a valentine thrown to the past, a ballad full of love. Hecht used to be a roadshow acrobat. He changed his mind and turned violinist. Changed his mind again and became a reporter. He's got a habit of carrying a torch for mankind. Harry Hansen calls him the Pagliacci of the fire escapes. MacArthur, husband of Helen Hayes, is the son of a minister and studied for the pulpit himself. With Hecht, he's written such other hits as 20th Century and several great pictures, including The Scoundrel, the Academy Award winner, which they also produced. An orchid, then, to a couple of the ablest craftsmen of our time. Now, just one more question, Walter, which all Hollywood is anxious to hear the answer. Have you swapped Broadway for Hollywood Boulevard, or are you going back to New York? Of course I'm going back, Josephine, just as soon as I finish the next picture, probably in October. It's called Love and Hisses, with the last two syllables dedicated, of course, to Ben Burney. <laughs> and now to you, James Gleason, and to you, Josephine Hutchinson, thanks for a very fine lesson in acting. Speaking for myself, it's the other way round. And special thanks to you, Mr. DeMille, and the Lux Radio Theater. Mm -hmm. Let's hope you'll be back here in a flash with a smash. <laughs> Mr. Winchell, Miss Hutchinson, our thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Ruick. Our play and stars for next week will be revealed in just a moment by Mr. DeMille. Tonight's cast included John Butler as Wilson, Frank Sheridan as Sheriff, Georgia Kane as Mrs. Grant, Edward Marr as Murphy, Victor Rodman as Bensinger, Lou Merrill as Swartz, Matt Moore as Kruger, Eddie Waller as Jacoby, Rolf Sedan as Pincus, Sidney Newman as Diamond Louie, Bud McTaggart as Earl Williams, and Ross Forrester and Frank Nelson as police officers. We thank the Andrew Jurgens Company for Mr. Winchell's appearance this evening. Miss Hutchinson appeared through courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios. James Gleason, RKO, where his new picture is entitled, Forty Naughty Girls. <laughs> Mr. DeMille is from Paramount, and Mr. Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for Shirley Temple's new picture, We Willie Winky. And here is our producer. There are stars in the heavens and plays in the theater whose brilliance time cannot dim. Such a play we present next Monday night. A tender romance made famous by Richard Mansfield. Many of you saw it on the stage or screen. All of you will have a chance to hear it one week from tonight when the Lux Radio Theater offers Bo Brummel, starring Robert Montgomery with Madge Evans, Leo G. Carroll, Bramwell Fletcher, and Jean and Kathleen Lockhart. As guest of honor, if she arrives in time, Miss Amelia Earhart will give us the highlights of her amazing flight around the world, which she is now completing. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Montgomery in Bo Brummel with Madge Evans and an all-star Hollywood cast. Our prospective guest, Amelia Earhart. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Thank you.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.